Deep in the mountains of Cuba, charismatic leader Fidel Castro leads guerrilla fighters on a mission to take the island nation by storm. As the first shots ring out against U.S.-backed President Batista's troops, a nation's destiny strikes a new course. For years, the people's struggle failed to spark change, but the flames are finally ignited. This is the moment a revolution turns into a war. These are the events that shape our world. These are the leaders that risk it all. These are the final moments before war. This is Edge of War. In war, sometimes a simple idea is all it takes to tip the balance of power. Revolutionary struggles and resistance movements, large and small, are built on a foundation of ideas and ideologies. The courage and loyalty of any regular army also depends on its acceptance of certain nationalistic and patriotic notions. Looking at great military leaders throughout history, we find their ability to outmatch and outmaneuver the enemy pales in comparison with their ability to inspire and influence their own men. Still, this semi-intangible factor is hard for many military strategists to measure, and as a result, it's often overlooked. The great military and political upsets of our time are born of just such dangerous and foolish oversights. Sometimes, just an idea is all it takes to rip a country apart. In a quiet farmhouse in Oriente province, a small band of Cuban rebels are preparing for a daring raid on a well-defended military installation. Dissatisfied with the effectiveness of nonviolent opposition to General Fulgencio Batista's regime, they're now committed to following their leader, the fiery and outspoken revolutionary Fidel Castro, into battle. Fidel Castro emerged as an inspiring and charismatic leader, campaigning for social justice and against political corruption. By January of 1953, Fidel had come to the realization that really the only way to topple the Batista regime would be through extra-legal means. So it's at that point that he begins to organize, to gather weapons, to do weapons training, and launch the armed struggle. Castro's main target is the Moncada military barracks, a military garrison on the outskirts of Santiago de Cuba in Oriente. Fidel Castro's plan was that 16 cars would drive up to the gates of the Moncada barracks. The men in the cars would be disguised in army uniform and the guards would confuse them for being military officers. They would open the gates and that would give the conspirators time to then open fire on the guards, get into the barracks. And then it was hoped that um, the local military house there would take the side of the, of the revolutionaries. Castro's objectives are to gain possession of the weapons in the barracks and to seize the Santiago radio station located inside the compound. The upstart rebel's plan is to broadcast a message to the entire country, demanding a return to democracy. The 95 attackers are armed with mismatched shotguns, old rifles, some handguns, and one 45 caliber submachine gun. They face a thousand soldier garrison that is outfitted with the latest in American weaponry and small arms, including Thompson submachine guns. Fidel's group sets out at 445 from the Sibonet farm. They're immediately separated as a caravan because a bunch of these guys have no idea where they are. So they get lost and in fact never participate in the barracks assault. The smaller number continue onto the barracks. What's left of the assault force, about a hundred men, now breaks into various groups, each heading to their assigned position. The first car, draped with military flags, arrives at gate three of the barracks and is waved through. Moments later, Castro's car is spotted and stopped by two guards who are not fooled. A firefight erupts. Suddenly, alarms ring out at all four entrances. In minutes, the entire garrison is awake and ready to fight. 
Castro's plan descends into chaos. The Moncada attack was a complete disaster for the rebels. It relied heavily on the element of surprise, which the attacking forces lost almost immediately. So the whole attack revealed Castro's inabilities as a military commander. Amazingly, only six of Castro's men are killed in the fighting. In the military pursuit that follows, however, 55 of the surviving 94 rebels lose their lives. Most are shot after they surrender. Castro escapes execution only to face Batista's justice system. Trained as a lawyer, Castro turns the court proceedings into a political attack against the dictator and his regime, laying out his revolutionary tenets for all of Cuba to hear. Fidel Castro is sentenced to 15 years behind bars. Undaunted, he continues his revolutionary efforts against Batista, who only nine years earlier was the democratically elected president. Batista was a good president from 1940 to 1944. He stamped out quite a bit of corruption, and he brought an era of prosperity and growth to the island. In 1952, Batista turns on his former political allies and seizes power. And there's a Greek tragic quality to that because he destroys the democratic institutions he helped establish earlier in his career. The new dictator's loyal military quickly silences all forms of domestic opposition. It's a dangerous time for citizens that crave freedom. But dangerous or not, Castro, from his prison cell, keeps up the message of change. While in prison, Fidel was able to get out his revolutionary manifesto page by page. Castro writes his manifesto using lemon juice. His invisible words later emerge by applying heat. And that manifesto became a lightning rod for opposition to Batista outside of jail and among various opponents of the regime. A new movement takes shape. Cubans all over the island hear the call. One person inspired by Castro's words is Celia Sanchez. At just 23 years of age, Celia organizes a group of local peasants in the Sierra Maestra Mountains and prepares them for the coming struggle. She begins a secret correspondence with Fidel. Castro is bolstered by Celia's courage. He tells her that she is a constant source of strength for him. Meanwhile, in Santiago, an inspired 19-year-old university student by the name of Frank Pais begins his own revolutionary movement. He sets up clandestine cells, collects weapons, money, and medical supplies. Pais also publishes a secret bulletin that criticizes the government and helps spread Castro's writings throughout Cuba. One of the major goals of the urban underground was to break Batista's monopoly on the press. They printed Fidel's manifesto and they dropped these off in hundreds of copies all over the cities of Cuba, um, usually by dropping them off in the middle of the night to buildings, to street corners, and letting people pick them up. February 1954. General Batista makes an official visit to the prison where Castro was held. Castro is determined not to waste the opportunity. Adelante. is called the Freedom March. No and Castro's actions get him thrown into solitary confinement indefinitely. When word of rebellion begins to spread through an oppressed population, 
dictators are forced to make some difficult decisions. A dictator is rarely the type of guy who's going to simply relinquish his power. But if he chooses to crack down on dissent, he risks losing legitimacy at home and suffering criticism around the world. If he doesn't use violence, he risks losing control of his own people. By the start of 1955, Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista faces this very dilemma. If he goes too far, if he's too heavy-handed, he risks creating a martyr, undermining his own regime in the process. In 1955, Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista is at the height of his power. Under his rule, the Cuban middle and lower classes struggle for survival, while the upper classes prosper. Prosperity due in no small part to Batista's reputed ties with the U.S. Mafia. The United States sees in Batista stabilizing force in Cuba. With him in power, business will be good there. That's been the central goal of U.S. foreign policy throughout the Caribbean in Latin America. It's willing to tolerate dictators of all sorts as long as the business climate remains good. As revolutionary sentiment begins brewing, Batista uses his media to conceal public unrest. What he doesn't suppress with propaganda, he leaves to the work of his secret police. It was a difficult time. It was unpredictable, violent, and people were afraid. May 13th, 1955. The people of Cuba press for change. Under mounting public pressure, Batista plays politics. Portraying himself as a humanitarian, he passes the Forgive and Forget Bill, an act of amnesty and goodwill toward his opponents. Fidel Castro and other political prisoners are set free. In the case of Fidel Castro, I think Batista recognized it was wiser for him to release this rebel who was only gaining in political popularity as a result of the publication of his political writings while he was in prison. Castro even gives the struggle a name, the 26th of July movement. The 26th of July movement gets its name from the assault on the Mocada barracks in 1953. It's largely comprised of middle-class professionals, doctors, lawyers, professors, intellectuals, who shared a kind of political culture with the majority of Cubans. Uh, they wanted non-intervention from the United States. They really wanted to transform the economy of the island to benefit the majority and not just foreign investors. Even though he's no longer in prison, Castro is well aware that he is still not a free man. Frustrated by constant police surveillance and determined to keep the movement alive, Castro leaves Cuba and travels to Mexico. Though he has no military experience, he vows to raise a revolutionary army and return at its head. Recruits from Cuba and many other Latin American countries follow him. They begin to train in wilderness survival and guerrilla warfare. Castro rented a ranch outside of Mexico City that was large enough to accommodate all of his men, but also provided enough ground for him to train his men secretly. During that time when uh, Fidel was in Mexico, lots of um, people in the rebel movement went back and forth between Mexico and Cuba. Um, they transferred money, uh, brought information to Fidel, so it was very easy for him to keep in touch. One night in late 1955, Castro was introduced to a fiercely intelligent physician by the name of Ernesto Che Guevara. Che was on a political and intellectual journey that took him from his native Argentina all around South America and into Central America. From there, he went to Mexico City and eventually met up with Fidel Castro. Spending an evening with the inspiring Cuban, Guevara is convinced that Castro's cause is the one that he's been searching for. He immediately begins training with the other men. With his support growing and his fighters trained, Castro purchases a 58-foot yacht, the Grama. The rebels plan to pack it with enough weapons and fighters to support their invasion. 
For his plan to succeed, Castro knows he must coordinate the assault with his allies back in Cuba. So he sends a message to Frank Pais, leader of the urban underground in Santiago. Frank Pais was well positioned as a member of the lower middle class in Santiago to reach poor sectors and to be trusted by them. And those are sectors that not necessarily would trust Fidel Castro or even know who he was. So he brings with him all of that prestige plus 200 well-organized and disciplined guerrillas. Castro and Pais hammer out the specifics of a coordinated attack. They choose November 30th, 1956. Castro and his men will land in Cuba and establish a fighting front in the Sierra Maestras. Pais will launch a full-scale attack in Santiago. Their plans made, Castro steps up his training. Frank Pais works overtime to swell the ranks of his clandestine urban army. The urban underground was organized into cells of four to five people in which no one knew each other's real name. There would always be one person who served as a link to another cell, and essentially link to link, they would get information distributed nationwide. The goal of the urban underground is to strike fear in Cuba, to show that Batista doesn't have absolute control of the country. Quietly, they go about distributing propaganda and recruiting new members as well. Pais recruits Cubans from all walks of life in all classes of society. Women as well as children are encouraged to join the fight for the return of Cuban democracy. Women were very critical to the underground precisely because they could move and, and carry weapons without really incurring the suspicion of police and security forces. On the other hand, when they were arrested, they were not just tortured and brutalized, as men were, but they were tortured, brutalized, and often raped by the security forces, if not always raped. By early 1956, neither Batista nor the revolutionaries know the extent of the organization Frank Pais has been able to build. Most believe the 26th of July movement is a fringe group of radicals, with their leader in exile. Pais decides it's time for perception to change. That night, under cover of darkness, urban underground members show their strength. As the sun rises over Santiago, the city is covered in revolutionary slogans. The impact of strategies like the spray painting of Santiago was largely to make people feel empowered by this movement, to feel that they were essentially so daring that they could interrupt or disrupt the voice and representation of reality of Batista and the regime. Emboldened, the movement now turns to the invasion. Celia Sanchez is sent to rendezvous with Castro at the beach and escort him and his men into the mountains. As the invasion date approaches, all three leaders coordinate their strategies. Little do they know, they are not the only ones in on the plan. Batista gets his information about the Castro movement from various sources. He has his own spies, he utilizes Mexican intelligence, and there's also the United States which is feeding him some information. To succeed, the rebels' plan depends on the element of surprise, but surprise is lost before the battle even begins. Castro's invasion of Cuba is destined to become another disaster. The element of surprise is often instrumental in determining the fate and fortune of military actions. But even using today's extensive intelligence gathering capabilities, a commander can never be certain he's going to achieve the surprise he seeks until the actual battle begins. That's the only true test. The leader who passes is the leader who truly understands the science and art of decision making, knowing whether to decide, when to decide, and what to decide. The Grandma, a small yacht packed with munitions and firearms and more than 80 fighters, casts off from the port of Tuxpan, Mexico, sailing for Cuba and revolution. Castro and his rebel army left Mexico around 2 a.m. in a driving rainstorm. And as soon as they entered the Gulf, the choppy waters made everybody on board seasick. And given that they had loaded so many men and arms and supplies on board, there's no room for anybody to move around. So they're throwing up on each other. It's just a miserable, miserable start to the invasion of Cuba. 
Castro has calculated that the 1,500-mile journey will take him five days to complete. However, excessive weight and a malfunctioning motor means the grandma can only do seven of its expected ten knots. And there's an even bigger problem. The Mexican and American intelligence agency detected the departure of the grandma soon after it left port. And so the entire Cuban Air Force and Navy was on alert. The only thing they did not know was where it would land in Cuba. Meanwhile, in Santiago, plans are made for the November 30th uprising, designed as a diversion for Castro's arrival. Frank Pais and his assault force have three main objectives, the Maritime Police Headquarters, the National Police Headquarters, and the famed Moncada Barracks, the site of Castro's failed 1953 insurrection. But when November 30th arrives, the grandma is still far from Cuban shores. With no way of knowing Castro's running behind schedule, Frank Pais orders his men into position just before dawn. One of the rebels, heading to a secret mortar emplacement outside the city, is recognized by a passing police patrol. He's arrested, and the military is put on high alert. By the time Pais gives the order to attack, Batista's men are waiting. Across the city, rebels are cut down by the military's coordinated defense. Frank Pais and the rebels were overpowered by the Cuban army, but they had to go through with it regardless because it was planned as a diversion for the landing of the grandma. By 11 a.m., Pais orders a retreat. His fighters change into their civilian clothes and blend back into the population. The military scours the city, hunting down those responsible for the attack. It's a complete disaster. Had it gone correctly, the uprising in Santiago and the landing of Fidel's forces would have happened simultaneously. But because Fidel is three days late, it gives Batista's forces a chance to really annihilate all the activists in Santiago and then turn their full attention to waiting for Fidel on the coast. On December 2nd at 4.20 in the morning, the hull of the grandma finally connects with Cuban soil. The landing is a disaster. The boat is heavily weighted down. There are far too many men on it, and so it gets stuck in the swamps. Batista sends the Air Force, strafes them from the air. The air attack scatters the invaders, forcing them to leave precious weapons and ammunition on the shore. Fidel Castro led his men inland, trying to get to the Sierra Maestra as quickly as possible. Pursued by the army, Castro pushes his comrades toward the safety of the mountains. Castro and the surviving revolutionaries believe they've eluded Batista's forces. But once again, inexperience is their undoing. And his men made it easier for the Batista army to find them by chewing on sugarcane stalks and tossing the remains onto the ground, leaving like a trail of breadcrumbs for the army to follow them. Before they knew it, they were under mortar fire and machine gun fire, and the result was the complete dispersal and rout of the rebel army. loses over 75% of his men before his invasion has a chance to begin. The Grandma Landing was a complete disaster. One of the Cuban rebels described it later as a shipwreck, not an invasion. Everything went wrong. News spreads that Fidel Castro has been killed. When Batista claimed that Fidel had died in this operation, pretty much everybody believed him because he controlled the press and he could say anything he wanted. The Batista regime responds with tremendous brutality. For every government official that's murdered by the rebels, the government kills several rebels. And typically, their bodies are mutilated and they're left on display in some public area to instill fear in the populace. 
Batista's intimidation methods spread fear across the island, but his demoralizing message is not the only one that reaches the revolutionaries. The 26th of July movement had built up a strong network in Oriente province that included a number of peasants who were familiar with the region. They were able to counter the propaganda that Batista had been spreading, including the news that Castro was killed. Eventually, they were able to get word to Frank Pais and others in the network that Castro and at least 15 other men had survived. In early December, the young revolutionary Celia Sanchez and her group of armed guerrillas link up with what remains of Castro's force. Celia leads them to the safety of the mountains where she has weapons, food, and supplies waiting. The peasant network in Oriente provided the rebels with critical supplies of recruits, funds, ammunition, food, absolutely everything. Without that network, without Celia Sanchez, the rebels would not have survived. Weeks pass, and with Celia by his side, Castro learns how to stage a guerrilla campaign. The small force digs in and fortifies its mountain stronghold. Early on, Fidel's forces are largely engaged in marching from one place to the other, digging trenches to, so that they can maintain their positions, and effectively trying to gain the trust of the peasant population. They began to set up shops, factories, bakeries, even armaments factories, in an effort to become self-sufficient. Life in the wilderness was really tough for these men. The heat, the bugs, the general terrain, the isolation was very, very difficult, and it certainly tested their commitment to the cause. The first six months for the rebel army were the most difficult for the men. Constantly under attack, constantly on the move, living in poor conditions, it was a testing ground for the men. As a new year dawns, while most of Cuba thinks him dead, Castro reasserts himself as the leader of a reborn, re-energized revolutionary front. In early 1957, Batista's Air Force bombed a rebel position. Castro subsequently discovered that a peasant had betrayed the position to the Cuban army. And as a result, Castro had the man arrested and court-martialed. The peasant was sentenced to death. Despite Castro's verdict, his rebels are reluctant to carry out the execution. The condemned man pleads with them. None of the rebels wanted to carry out the order. After a long and awkward moment, Che Guevara stepped up and shot him. The message is clear. The stakes cannot be higher. It is as Fidel foretold, the choice is victory or death, with nothing in between. As his rebel fighters fortify their mountain stronghold, Fidel Castro follows a playbook set out by insurgents throughout history. All successful guerrilla campaigns pass through three stages. First, there's the latent and incipient rebellion, where dissent is spread and rebel structures are organized. Then comes the execution of small-scale hit-and-run operations against isolated government forces. And lastly, if these operations succeed in gaining weapons, popular support, and moral ascendancy, the insurgency moves to phase three, a war of movement against government main forces, open warfare. As 1957 begins, Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista has an unshakable grip on his people. Batista was a formidable opponent, uh, mainly because he had a professional U.S.-trained, U.S.-backed army, all the weapons he wanted. And then perhaps more importantly, he also had tremendous control over people's perceptions of reality. Uh, he was constantly depicting his opponents as small in number, as not really a threat, and it was hard to believe the opposite might be true. If Castro's battle for democracy stands a chance, 
his message opposing the tyrant must be heard. It's the middle of the Cold War. It's fashionable to describe all your enemies as communists. Batista, in an effort to ruin Castro's reputation, calls him a communist. The fact is the intelligence services don't know what Castro's ideological leanings are. Celia Sanchez reaches out to American journalist Herbert Matthews and secretly escorts him into the mountains. Herbert Matthew was a journalist from the New York Times and he interviewed Castro and wrote several articles about him and uh, called him the Robin Hood of the Americas. And that's the vision that a lot of the world has had of him for many years. Herbert Matthews projects Fidel Castro onto an international stage. In the spring of 1957, he does three front page stories in the New York Times talking about the rebel movement. Now losing ground in the international media, the dictator steps up the efforts of his secret police to suppress the people. As opposition gathered against his rule, Batista responded with wide-scale violence against the rebels and their supporters in their homes and at various facilities around Havana and the country. While Batista denies being involved in any atrocities, his security forces use overwhelming violence against anyone accused of being a rebel. They leave mutilated corpses in public as a warning. But this destroys any legitimacy Batista's government still has. It's been well documented that Batista used torture and terrible types of torture. As word got around of these stories of torture, it really increased the opposition to Batista. Castro isolated in the mountains, rebel cells continue lashing out in anger across the island. I was a teenager at that time, and we weren't allowed to go out uh, very much because there were bombs exploding in Havana every single evening. Dissent continues to grow among the Cuban masses, and more groups take matters into their own hands. A student group from the University of Havana takes up arms and storms the presidential palace. They make it all the way to Batista's office, missing the dictator by a matter of minutes. Had Batista been where he was supposed to be, they would have killed him, but he had just left. So it failed, it degenerated, and a lot of the revolutionaries were killed. At this point, uh, the movement against Batista is really not about the, the Sierra guerrilla. They're not so much a threat to him as those thousands of urban activists and the guys in the countryside as well who are constantly issuing daily attacks and challenges to the regime, as well as to the functioning of the economy, because really everything sort of depended on Batista's ability to deliver economic stability and security to his foreign backers. Heading up the urban underground in Havana is Manuel Rai, a talented engineer who once worked for Batista's public works. Rai uses insider knowledge and stolen blueprints to attack the regime's infrastructure, one bomb at a time. Aurora was Manuel Rai's wife. Batista's forces were constantly raiding her house because they were convinced that she would know where he was. She was a great actress, though, and every time she would be arrested, she would be dragged in and she would tell the police she had no idea where her husband was and that he was a tremendous bastard for ditching her, that she hadn't seen him in years. And in fact, the opposite was true. She was seeing him in at least once every two weeks, and she knew exactly where he was at every moment. Some rebel leaders are not as fortunate. July 30th, 1957, Frank is staying at a safe house in Santiago. Unfortunately, an informant told the police his location. 
They show up, surround the house, and he slips out the back along with the other member of the 26th July, but they don't make it very far. In fact, they're, they're shot pretty much on the street, on site. At just 23 years of age, Frank Pais, the chief architect of the urban arm of the Cuban Revolution, is gunned down by Batista's secret police. Batista is not prepared for what happens the next day. The effect of Frank Pais's death was electric on the population of Santiago. Tens of thousands of people showed up for his funeral. No one expected that many people to show up, and certainly not Batista's forces. In fact, it was as if the whole city had turned out to show their opposition to Batista. When Frank Pais's body is put on display in the coffin, they drape it in a flag of the 26th of July, which was an act of treason. And in fact, everybody showed up with flags of or dressed in red and black. I mean, it was an incredible display of opposition. Thousands of Cubans came out to support the rebels, and um, the rebels walked among the, the mourners, and it was a groundswell of support for the rebels. It was quite clearly um, opposite of what the government had been telling everyone. The government propaganda had been saying that um, it was a minor movement. This showed the opposite. Castro is now the main focal point of the armed insurrection. He begins to galvanize widespread national support. Batista's media can no longer hide the realities of the revolution. By this time, the rebels had grown in size and experience. Uh, their numbers had increased to maybe 200, up to 300 men. Uh, they had gained great experience in guerrilla warfare and were quite accomplished at it. They were very good, for example, at setting and carrying out ambushes, to the extent that Batista's army began to fear pursuing the rebels into their mountains because the rebels had prepared the terrain and were waiting for them. Attempting to crush the revolution once and for all, Batista orders his military into the mountains. As he engages Castro in open combat, Batista assures his allies that the revolution is all but over. When leading an assault on a fixed position, military commanders need to know the terrain they're attacking into and the strength of the defenders. General Batista's army lacks solid information in both these categories. Blindly, Batista and his generals believe his overwhelming military might will neutralize his opponent. It's a terrible mistake. He misunderstands the fundamentals of counterinsurgent warfare. Attacking a military force of unknown size, on unfamiliar ground, without popular support, without moral ascendancy, it's a recipe for failure with high casualties. Summer 1958. Losing his control of Cuba to an increasingly popular revolutionary movement, dictator Fulgencio Batista must take a decisive step to stop the threat to his regime. He calls his action Operation Verano. By June of 1958, the rebels were firmly entrenched in the Sierra Maestra. Batista finally decided the time had come to launch a full-scale offensive against those rebel positions, convinced that he could indeed drive them out of the mountains. Batista assures his supporters that before the summer is out, the revolution will be no more. Batista plans to send in 12,000 professional troops to fight the guerrilla in Oriente. And it's really going to be the first major encounter that these guerrillas have had with any sizable force. On the one hand, you have 12,000 troops on Batista's side, facing only 300 guerrilla. But those 12,000 troops were largely unseasoned, and they were pretty much terrified of Fidel's forces. Spies, scouts, and runners bring Castro the news. The army is coming. 12,000 strong. Although outnumbered, the rebels are confident they are not outmatched. Castro has the advantages of guerrilla warfare. He's got the support of the local population. He knows this terrain. And so when Batista sends his troops there, Castro is fighting in his own backyard. The guerrillas had developed a system of using loudspeakers in the jungle, and in some cases they would surround Batista's forces uh, with the loudspeakers and blast music, uh, jingles, songs at them. 
This would completely freak the soldiers out because they would just hear this music coming from what seemed like everywhere around them. The rebels had prepared the terrain in the Sierra Maestra. They had planted mines in the pass leading into the mountain. They were waiting for the offensive. At the Estrada Palma sugar mill, Castro's fighters anxiously await the major offensive from Batista's forces they know and dread is about to explode. When government troops arrive, the rebel ambush is ready. The attack hands Batista's men a devastating defeat. And as the assault spread across the mountains, his troops proved to be unprepared for this type of combat. In desperation, Batista calls for a flanking maneuver, an amphibious landing south of Castro's main camp. The rebel intelligence network is so advanced that Castro learns when and where Batista will land. He prepares two 50 caliber machine gun emplacements and aims them at the beach. Given the number of troops that Batista put into the field, they should have been able to wipe out the rebel army. But they were not winning the war. They suffered heavy casualties, the morale of their units went down, while the morale of the rebel forces just increased. The army doesn't want to fight for him, so finally Batista has to pull them out. And once he does that, that opens up the entire island to Castro. The embarrassing failure of Operation Verano deals a serious blow to the dictator, and he's fast running out of friends. It becomes clearer and clearer in the summer of 1958 that Batista can no longer control Cuba, and the U.S. and foreign investors start to abandon him. Having repulsed the summer offensive, Castro decides that he's strong enough now to launch a counteroffensive. So he sends two of his columns across the island, essentially cutting the island in two. With Batista's forces retreating to their strongholds, Castro orders his men forward. This begins a dangerous, open ground military offensive against the dictator, a dagger thrust aimed straight for Havana. Civil war engulfs the country. As they celebrate Castro's triumphant charge, they have no way of knowing that he, like Batista, will one day turn his back on democracy and become the very thing he fought to depose, dictator of Cuba. In the fall of 1958, the Cuban Revolution moves into its final stage, outright war of movement. Around the world, the Cold War rages. The communists in China and the Soviet Union are consolidating their power. Korea is a nation divided, and Indochina remains embroiled in conflict. Fidel Castro's rebels will soon threaten the creation of another red state, this time just 90 miles off the American coast. The famous fight between the heavyweight personalities of Fidel Castro and dictator Fulgencio Batista single-handedly extends the front lines of the Cold War almost to the shores of America. Castro eventually comes to play a critical and dangerous role in the world's approaching nuclear standoff as he abandons the very ideals of his own revolution. He endures into the beginning of the 21st century as a totalitarian dictator, crushing the democratic inspiration of his own rebellion and choking the aspirations of the Cuban people.